it, so I have a little bit of, not fear, but I have a little bit of I don't know, anxiety, and I'm not supposed to be anxious. It's because I'm not actually going through a portion of scripture and teaching it. I'm actually bringing in some other information, so it's going to be good, and then we'll, we'll finish the lesson. We'll do like a little devo just so we can, we can eat tonight, right? We're going to eat of the word, drink of the word, and so we can feel nourished. So if you were here last week, if you weren't here, I encourage you to uh, watch it online. But Daniel was here, and he started us off with a series of essentials, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit more what the essentials are. But he, just to review, he talked about monotheism, right? And he talked about the Trinity. And he talked about how the Trinity is three co-equal and co-eternal beings. It's not modalism, which is like one, you know, three, you know, one God, but three different beings. Like one day God's the son, and then one day God's the father, and then one day God's the son. That's moralism. That's not biblical Christianity. Well, the Trinity is you have one God, yet being represented by three co-equal and co-eternal persons. And then we also discussed, or he discussed how um, we don't understand that. You know, that's okay, because you're not God, and I'm not God, and when we're in heaven, I, I believe when we're in heaven for all of eternity, he's just going to be awe-inspiring. He's just going to, you know, our jaw drop to the floor every time. Because we'll just never be able to truly just grasp his beauty, his glory, his everything, right? He's just too much. And so uh, we talked about we were to believe the word of God, right? We may not understand everything everything about God but I believe because the word of God says and so this is the standard we're going to, this is what we're going to talk about today uh, we're, remember he also talked about familiarizing yourself with the genuine so that we recognize a counterfeit he used the example of money right but you know if you handle enough real money when you get a fake bill you'll, you'll be able to spot it easier right and then Again, leaning not to our own understanding, that God is not limited by our intellect, by what we understand. It's not, oh God, you can only operate in my understanding, in my box, and how I perceive you to be. Uh -uh, that's not how God is, right? There are lots of things we don't understand. So we'll continue with that last week's theme, right? We're going into continuing with the essentials. So what are the essentials of Christianity? And I'll give you some, being a nerd, I'm gonna, I'll give you some, uh, I'll give you my, my sites that I use. So if you wanna check it out, or if you really wanna be a nerd, I actually, um, I, this is a Google doc that I use, and it, it's a live document, and I have links on here. I wasn't planning on sharing it, but if anybody wants like some of these links, I have a QR code that you can, access the document so if you're interested so let's talk about the essentials i got this from gotquestions.org that's a great website johnny had mentioned it a few weeks ago and so i've been i've been on there so it's really nice and it, it, a quote from it it says the bible itself reveals what is important and essential to the christian faith these essentials are the deity of christ which we touched on a little last week Salvation by God's grace and not by works. Salvation through Jesus Christ alone. The resurrection of Christ. The gospel. Monotheism. And the Holy Trinity. And if you think of it this way, I love the way I've been reading this book. And one of these days I'm going to finish it. It's called Set Adrift. It's written by McDowell and Maria, I believe. I don't know. I think I'm right. I thought he worked with them. Anyways, uh, he talks about a, think of, think of Christianity, if you will, biblical Christianity being a fence, a pasture. Like there's a pasture and then there's this fence that goes around it. The fence is like the essentials, is what we call dogma or creed, right? Like, so if we were to say this fence is a deity of Christ, this is the Trinity, right? And then within that 
fence, you could have different doctrines. So for example, eschatology. So some, a one Christian who adheres to the essentials, right? That would agree in on everything that Jesus is the only way, salvation by grace is faith alone. But let's say they don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Let's say they believe in a post-tribulation. Throw them out, right? They're not, they're not going to heaven. They're not a Christian. No, that's not what that means. What it's saying is as long as they're within the fence, they're within biblical Christianity. The issues arise when you start going beyond or over that fence. So when you start saying that, oh, well, Jesus isn't the only way. Well, then you've gone beyond the fence because the fence is, again, think of the fence being like, this is a dogma, this is the creed. So anything over is outside of biblical Christianity. So if you were to say, oh, there are many gods, you know, you can kind of believe what you want, then you're no longer a biblical Christian. So hopefully that makes sense a little bit. I had a nice picture in my, in my notes, in case you're interested. So that might help. Um, Let's talk a little more about this, uh, about essentials. So in the early 300s, so way a long time, well, even before Don or Mark were born, so the 300 AD, roughly around there, right? You had this group called, the, called Arianism, or this, it's a sect that was from a dude named Arian. And Arianism, they did not believe in the deity of Christ. So they didn't believe that Jesus was God, but yet they had infiltrated the church and they were claiming that they were Christian. And this is very similar to Jehovah's Witnesses that would, would say that Jesus is a created being, right? They would say that Jesus is not the creator. He's not the eternal one that he has created. And so in response to that in 300, around there like 325, the early church got together and they wanted to basically come up with a statement or a creed of what is biblical Christianity. And you've probably heard this before. I'm going to read it to you. And you're going to see the most important thing in this is that they derived this from Scripture. It wasn't their opinion. You know, this is what we think biblical Christianity is. No, this is what the Bible teaches what biblical Christianity is. And so I'm going to read it to you, so bear with me. It says, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. The Catholic there speaks of universal, all tribes, all nations, not a, not a particular like Roman Catholic. So we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. So the, they, this was in response to this sect that had infiltrated the church and was proclaiming to be Christian, but yet stating that Jesus was, was not deity, that Jesus was a created being. And so that's why the church can uh, establish this as this is foundational, this is essential Christianity. And one of the arguments you'll hear, and I've heard from, I don't know if you know this, but I actually, before I became a Christian, I actually studied with Jehovah's Witnesses. And one of the arguments that they would use is, well, the Trinity wasn't created until 300 when the Nicene Creed came out. That's not true. The Trinity, as we learned last week, was 
is in the Bible. Now, now it was, the creed was written in 300, but it was just affirming what the Bible already teaches. Right? It wasn't like, oh, we just made this concept of the Trinity up in 300 or 325. You know what I'm saying? It was in response to uh, a heretical teaching. And so that was the purpose of that. Okay, as I always do, I'm going to give you some fun facts. So are you ready? So for your next Bible fun fact, fun fact party. Ready? So what the Bible is not just one book. Okay, this is a, a compilation of 66 books written over 1,500 years. It's multiple authors over multiple time periods. So obviously with over 1,500 years, from political leaders like Moses, military leaders like Joshua, fishermen like Peter, doctor like Luke, tax collector like Matthew, and a rabbi like Paul. It was written in different places in the wilderness, like Moses, Jeremiah in a dungeon, Paul inside a prison, and Luke while traveling. These are examples, right? It was written on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Written in three languages. Not English, right? Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Jesus primarily spoke. Do you know what he was primarily spoke? Aramaic. Bonus. I knew Don would know. Thank you, Don. He primarily spoke Aramaic. Okay. It contains prophecy. Incredible amount of prophecy, actually. Most of the prophecy has already been fulfilled, especially as it pertains to the prophecy about Jesus, his first coming. It has accurate historical events, places, and figures. So if you're like a history major, you will reference the Bible. Even in a secular university, you, you will have Bible reference. It's, it's there because it's the people that it's there, the it, it, uh, locations are real, and so the Bible is a historical artifact or book. Yet, in all these things, when you talk about different locations, different people, different languages, different continents, there is such harmony and continuity regarding the author's testimony and relationship with the Eternal One the one we call Lord, the one we call God, and the message, the, which is the overall theme, the redemption of man, that God reveals himself, and how does God redeem sinful man? That is, we see this beautiful picture of this harmony, as I mentioned, that you couldn't do that. I mean, how can you do that? Like human beings, we can't do that apart from the supernatural, apart from God guiding us and leading us, right? So let's talk about manuscripts. So we know the Bible was translated. The New Testament was written in the first century AD. So some of the arguments are, are you will see, oh, the New Testament was written like three or 400 years after Jesus. No, it was written in Jesus' time. These, in fact, if you look, what, is, what does John say? John says that which we have what? what we have touched, what we have heard, what we have you know, seen. So John speaks as an eyewitness, as an example. And so they wrote within the first century. There are some 25,000 early manuscripts in existence of the New Testament, 25,000. And that might not be like a big number to us now because we have these things that can you know, print books out like, you know, like that. But back then, it was a very tedious process, right? They would get the scroll, and they would, they would write. And we know, like in the Old Testament, especially when, when the, the scribes would <clears throat> write the name of, of God, they would, like, stop before they even do that. They would go wash, right? And then they would go and write the name. So that's how so it was such a tedious process of translating. So the New Testament, we have 25,000 early manuscripts in existence. So there's Greek texts and so forth. So we compare that to Caesar's Gallic Wars, 
were written in the first century BC, and there's only 10 manuscripts. And then the early, earliest textual evidence we have was copied a thousand years after the original. So you, you have New Testament 25,000 manuscripts within that crucial time period, that first hundred years. And then you have in this example of the Gallic, Gallic Wars, there's only 10 manuscripts and the earliest, the earliest manuscript we have is roughly was copied about a thousand years after the original. So interesting. Aristotle Poetics was written in the fourth century BC and there are only five manuscripts in existence. Okay. This is important because if, if you go into the New Testament and we look at when we compare, when we go like from what we have today and we go back and we go back and we go back and we go back, it's roughly about 1% where we see there's differences. And the 1% is typically uh, grammatical. It's not like a major, like, oh, this, now our manuscripts say that Jesus isn't the only way. But back in 200 AD, they said that Jesus was the only way, right? It's the consistency is there. The harmony is there, which is really, really important. So that we can have confidence in what the Bible says. So the Bible is special and unique. So let's talk a little more about breathed out. So all scripture, this is 2 Timothy 3.16. And you may have heard this verse before. You may wonder, what does this actually mean? And we'll give you a couple of examples of what it doesn't mean. And then hopefully we'll be able to describe what it means. All scripture is breathed out or inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. So the God breathed. So this is the mode of inspiration. How did this take place? One view, which is not correct, I mean, it's going to say it's, the, it's mostly rejected. I wouldn't see that anybody would really hold to this, is the mechanical view. The mechanical view would be like the writers of the Bible were like taken over by the Holy Spirit and, and like, like they couldn't control, what am I writing? I can't even control my arm when I'm writing, right? And this, God's taken over, right? And so that's doesn't seem how God would do things, right? It's like God's not like, oh, all right, all right, write this. That's the mechanical or robotic view of God breathed. So probably not that. Another one is called a dictation theory, where God goes, okay, write this. The okay, got that? Got that. People, okay, got that. People, got that. That's a dictation theory. That's not. Most people don't, don't believe that's what God did. So what is it like? I think it's perfect how we just study the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 14. And think of, think of those examples, right? Think of how God will enable us by the Holy Spirit, empower us by the Holy Spirit to do his work, right? If, if God's giving you the gift of helps, you're just not like, oh, I have to help. I can't stop myself from helping somebody. It's just, it's just something supernatural that God has done, right? And so where you see that God, through his spirit, is he allows to, peep, to use people or he uses people as part of uh, his purposes and his plan. However, we need to also recognize that he, use, he use, uses their style and their vocabulary as well and their background. Let me explain that further. So when you look at the writings, like of Peter, Peter's writing is different than Paul. Well, why? Think about it. Peter was not educated. He was not educated at all. He was a fisherman. Paul was extremely educated. So here you have God inspiring Peter and Paul to write. And yet they would use, they would write from their experiences, from their vocabulary, from what they knew, but yet it was inspired. And so that's important to understand, okay? That God, it's that harmony and cohesion that he allows. Let's see. Um, 
As it relates to prophecy, however, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, verse 21 says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's the ESV. I don't know if I like the ESV in that one. Interesting. In inerrancy. So inerrancy, what does it mean when we say the Bible is inerrant? Okay. There's two words that people will throw around, inerrant and infallible. Infallible means that it's incapable of having error. Inerrant means it's just without error. So you have infallible, not even capable of having error. And inerrant, you have not having error without error. So the Bible in its original manuscript, right, where before it was translated hundreds of times, is considered to be inerrant. There is that, it's perfect. But when you go get put in the hands of man, you know, here, now you translate it, oh, you messed up that, you cross a T where you should have dotted the I, right? Then you have those, those like that 1% of those mistakes, right? However, no errors of truth. When the boy says that the Bible is inerrant, there's no errors of truth, there's no deceit, there's no lies. Okay, that's when you talk about the inerrancy. It doesn't mean that the Bible is, is you know, absolute and scientific precision, right? I'm not going to use the Bible to learn how to split an atom or something, right? It's, it's not designed for that. And we also know the Bible allow, allows for rounding of numbers. Let me give you an example. If, when it says that Jesus said the 5,000, was there, there better have been 5,000 exactly, or the Bible's lying, it's wrong. No, it allows for estimation. Maybe it was 4,998, maybe it was 5,022. I don't know. But it allows for that. Again, there's no errors of truth, right? There's no deceit, there's no lies. That's important that we understand that, okay? Have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? How many of you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Good, oh, good. I'm glad. I hope you know why they're important. If you don't, I'm going to teach you why. They're very, very important. So the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, so this is not that long ago, uh, you know, they're, the Dead Sea Scrolls are called the Dead Sea Scrolls because they were discovered by the Dead Sea. Basically, I think he was like a shepherd or something, and uh, some, one of the sheep or goat or whatever animal got loose, and he can't find, the, the shepherd can't find this animal, but the goat or the sheep, and so he's, he sees a cave, and he thinks, ah, I don't know, maybe he went in there, maybe I'll throw something in there to scare the, the goat or whatever to run out. And when he, this, when he, the shepherd threw the, the stone, it, it had a, a cracking sound. And it actually, it was the container of scrolls. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls contained partial and full Old Testament texts dating between 300 BC to 100 AD. So 300 years before Jesus and then 100 AD. The book of Isaiah is critical. The book of Isaiah was complete and dated to around 125 BC. The beautiful part about Isaiah, it is, they looked at 1947, they're like, it's the same as it was 125 BC. So 2,000 years later, it was the same, which is really important because we know Isaiah 53, yes? So it wasn't written, so one of the arguments that some people make about Isaiah 53, if you're familiar with it, you know, that's considered a messianic chapter where it talks about, it's talking about Jesus. If you never read it, I encourage you to read it. You know, by his stripes, we are healed and so forth. One of the arguments was, well, oh, that was written after Jesus, right? So that was written beyond AD. They, the Christians snuck that in there to try to show that, oh, see, the Old Testament prophesied about Jesus. Not so, because if you look at 125 years before Jesus, it was there. And so here, I want you to really see, the, get the impact of what that means. That God has preserved his word. 
The gospel message has been preserved for thousands and thousands of years. So we can rely on what the scripture says. It indicates the content and integrity of the message is, has been preserved. I remember when I went to, uh, a few years ago, there was an, uh, a museum down in San Diego actually had. What do we call it when museums do it? Is it it's not an exhibition, is that what it's called? Exhibit. <laughs> an exhibit, I can tell, uh, yeah, okay. So an exhibit, I was close, I said that's an ex exhibition. <laughs> they had the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit. Did anybody go there? I went there, it was about 10 years ago. Johnny went there? San Diego, right? San Diego, did you go? Was it awesome? Yeah, it was awesome. To this day, I remember, uh, 10 years ago, well, however long it was, or longer, I was probably only about five, so I was really young. No, I'm kidding, I was a joke, I was old. Um, I looked and they had, like, on the wall, if you remember, correct me if I'm wrong, they had the little, it was from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they had, because remember, the Dead Sea Scroll contains fragments of scripture as well as whole scrolls, right? And this was a fragment, and I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at the English, and it was, and I recognize it, it was Psalm 121, 1 and 2. I'll never forget it. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, right? You know that. From where, whence comes my help? That's the King James. <laughs> my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And I just blessed me. I was like, oh, it's like, I know what that said. I read that in my Bible. And yet here it is, thousands of years ago, other believers are reading the same scripture. And it just, it just put a little like wind in my sails and, and it just blessed me. Hopefully if you've ever uh, get a chance to, to look at it, I encourage you to, to just look and be blessed. Okay, let's talk about the canon of scripture, not like a canon, like a weapon. How do we get these 66 books, right? Like how do we determine th this is it, this is the Bible. Right? How do we determine that? And I'll, and I'll read this to you. I stole this from, uh, I, can't, I didn't cite it, uh oh, I forgot where I stole it, but it's, it's legit. The term canon is used to describe the books that are divinely inspired and therefore belong in the Bible. The difficulty in determining the biblical canon is that the Bible does not give us a list of books that belong in the Bible. Determining the canon was a process conducted first by Jewish rabbis and scholars and later by early Christians. Here's the key. Ultimately, it was God who decided what books belonged in the biblical canon. A book of scripture belonged in the canon from the moment God inspired its writing. It was simply a matter of God's convincing his human followers which books should be included in the Bible. So, Understanding, so the point of that, and I'll go a little bit more in detail, but the point of this is that God's the one that ultimately decided what's, what, because if he's going to go through all the trouble of preserving his word for thousands and thousands of years, he's also going to go through the trouble of making sure what, what parts of the, what is inspired and what isn't, what is canon. The Old Testament is, Hebrew believers recognize God's messengers it's usually easier in the Old Testament because, you know, they, it was like they recognized God's message, messenger and they, re, and they recognized they accepted their writings as inspired by God. Now, in the New Testament, again, there's no established, like, these are the rules, right? But here's some ideas on why in our New Testament these books were chosen as canon and others were not. Number one, it was written by an apostle or someone very close to an apostle. So that's usually, that's a good sign. And you see, you also see in scripture, two, two times we have one writer in the New Testament referencing another writer in the New Testament. I would be blown away if anyone knew, besides John A. can't answer. Did anyone take a wild guess who referenced to? I wonder, I didn't know. Again, Bible fun fact, you'll dazzle and amaze your friends. So the first one is Peter affirmed the writings of Paul in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. He says, that Paul guy is a good guy. It's good, good writing. That's not exactly what it says, but that's what it says. <laughs> All right. So Peter affirms Paul. And then Paul 
reference Luke. He referenced Luke in Luke 10.7. He, no, he referenced Luke 10.7, but he referenced it in 1 Timothy 5.18. And so that's, that's pretty cool how they, they reference each other. So that's a good sign. Another question they would ask, was the writing accepted by the people of God? Was this generally accepted as by the people of God? They would look at that. Did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodoxy? Right? Is it, is it consistent with, with scripture? It's not some oddball, you know, thing, you know, where Jesus did miracles as a, as a, as a child and that kind of weird stuff. And that's, that's, no, that's not, <laughs> not consistent with scripture. And then another good question, is it or was it dynamic? In other words, do you see life transforming power through the Holy Spirit, through the book? Right, because I can read, and you and I can read a book. Right, I, I can read, you know, a Tom Clancy book, and it doesn't hit me the same way the Bible does, right? Why, because the Bible is living. The Bible is spiritual. Remember. In John chapter six, where they accused Jesus of being a cannibal, you want to? Jesus was saying he is the bread of life, right? You want us to eat your flesh? Oh my goodness! And a lot of people left him, right? But what did he say? The words that he speaks are what spirit, and they are life. And so we know as believers, and we, and I know we shared last time I was here. We talked about it. I know some of you were nodding your head is before you came to Christ and before the Holy Spirit lived in you, before you became born again, you may have had an encounter with the Bible and been like, what is this, right? I remember my grandmother had a big, beautiful Bible on her, on her table. It was never open, but it was beautiful. And I remember one time I tried looking at it and I'm just like, what? This is like, might as well be Chinese to me. I don't get it. I don't want to get it, but I don't understand it. But then what happened when you came to the Lord, right? And then all of a sudden, you're reading the word and you're like, it's like, it's like talking to you. It's like, oh my gosh, you're like, you're like talking to me, Lord. It's because this is the word of truth, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, that we are to be faithful to study, to show thyself approved, right? We are to accurately handle or divide, cut up the word of truth. Jesus says what? Sanctify them by your word. What? Thy word is what? Truth. And so, so many people, I was talking to my supervisor today, and he just says, I never, he's in his 60s, and he's like, never in my life have I seen people just so in, how do we say, wanting truth. Like so many people today just wanting, not knowing they want God. Like no, not realizing what they are missing in life is God, is Jesus. And I said, that's so true. And the world as it continues to get darker and darker. Satan has always attacked God's word. Always. He will always question God's word. Because if we know if, if the Bible contains the message for how we might have salvation, of course he's going to question God's word. Has God really said that if you eat of that, you'll die? He said that from the very beginning. He questioned it. And then in, on Sunday... Uh, we went over one of the verses that Johnny mentioned was in Galatians chapter 1. And in Galatians, they were going off the deep end because they started to believe like in angels and all kinds of weird stuff, a different gospel. And to quote it exactly, Paul is writing to the, the believers in Galatia. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, now we say again, if anyone is preaching you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. So you, you see this attack by the forces of darkness by Satan, attack on the word of God. You see it at the beginning in Genesis. We see it in the beginning in the New Testament, the, the church. Psalm 119, 160 says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Don saying, You were singing some classics today. Hopefully, you guys knew what the second song, I Will Delight. Do you guys know what psalm that came out of? Which one? Psalm 1. Very good. I'll read it to you. And then we're going to go to Psalm 19. So if you open your Bibles to Psalm 19, we're going to do a little finish off the little Devo. Just let the Lord speak to you, right? Just let the Word do what it does in the Holy Spirit. Do what He does. Apparently, I don't know how to find Psalm 1. Psalm 1, it's a beautiful psalm writing. This is verse 2. Well, I'll just read verse 1. Why not? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the Bible. His delight is in the word of God. And on his law... He meditates day and night. We know that meditate, it, it, it has the think it, it, a picture of a cow chewing, right? Just chewing over its cud, right? It's chewing. So the meditation that we would chew God's word, that we would slowly chew it. We would meditate day and night. He is like a tree. What's the result? What's the result of chewing on God's word, of delighting in the law of God. It says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. It reminds me, John 15, where, what? I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we need to be connected to the Lord and we're connected through his word right as we meditate as we take it in as we ponder it as we think about it one of the things that I get to do and I'm privileged to do it is whenever I get an opportunity to share to teach I like to read before I read any commentary listen to anybody opinion or you know whatever you want to call it I like to just read it and I like to go over it and think about it and let the Lord, you know, speak to me through it. And then I like to, you know, let, let's see what this, this pastor said, you know, or let me read what this person said on it. Oh, it's pretty cool. It's like it adds a little more seasoning to it, right? It's like, oh, I didn't see that. It's so cool because God's gifted people, you know, to do this. Some people are very, you know, they've studied their whole lives. So why wouldn't I, you know, take advantage of that? But in Psalm 19, let's allow the Lord to minister to us about the Word of God. Psalm 19. Everyone still with me? No one asleep? No, it's okay. If you're here. 19. Not 119. 119 is good too. And that's, we're not going to read all that. That's a, that's a long <laughs> I'll get you out of here before 8, I promise. Psalm 19. Verse 7, when you verse, verse 7 through 10. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure 
enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of a honeycomb. If we need to be revived, right? We think of, when I think of revive, I think of, of them like, oh my gosh, we gotta do CPR. This person's, you know, this person's near death. Right? Or, we, or we gotta get the thing where they do like clear, right? I think sometimes even as believers, we go through those seasons where we're, and I know I can speak to myself, speak for myself then. I know there's times in my life where I'm just like dry, I'm just going through the motions. But knowing that the word of the Lord revives, makes me alive, revives the soul. And so that's an encouragement, um, uh, an admonition for you that if you're just kind of just drifting, that you would get into the word, you would delight in the law of the Lord and that you would meditate on it day and night. I love, where's this book? I'm going to share this little. My dad was, uh, went home to be with the Lord in 2018. And when he passed away, this is one of his, my dad's so funny. This is a book. This is a, this is called Many Evidences for the Infallible Christian Faith Proofs. It's a big old book. It's a good book, but it's not a book that I would recommend for the brand new believer. I mean, it's good. I mean, if you want it as a new believer, um, it, there's other books I'll, I can recommend in a moment, but. My dad, I saw his writing. I was like, oh, it's my dad block writing. I don't know how he always wrote that. That's my dad writing. And he put to Mike. So I mean, this isn't for Mike, I don't think. To Mike, and he put from Ray, he put his phone number, and then he quoted, and he wrote down Revelation 3.20, you know, I stand at the door and knock. So my dad had wanted to give this to somebody named Mike, and I, it's cool that I just saw this when I was going through some of my, my books. But then my dad also put something in there. He put 18 inches. And what my dad meant by that was we talk about the approximate distance between your head to your heart. It's 18 inches. And so we come here and when we study, I study to show myself approved that I can rightly handle the word of truth. But if it's not here, if it doesn't impact my life, I love when I had the opportunity on Sunday to sit. It was just, I was just hanging out with one. I only had one student. And it was so cool, though. Um, we were talking about the word. And, he, and I don't remember the exact conversation, but he said, when you apply it. So it's not just about hearing it, but when you apply it. And so here you have like this reminder that it's, not just about what we know. It's not about, oh, I, I know all these facts. But if it doesn't impact my life, if, the, if there is no love in my life, then what is it for? The more we get into the word, what happens? Our faith increases, right? It, it does. Our faith is going to increase because that's what the Bible says, that, right? That by, through hearing the word, our faith will increase. And then through faith, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please God, the Bible also says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. So this was a light appetizer version of, of Scripture, you can go, I mean, there is tons of stuff out there. You could spend, there are, there are people that have spent their lives on studying this. So this, I just wanted to give you a little kind of snippet of what, you know, if you wanted to study more, I would encourage you to do that. In the, ne in the next few weeks, I'm going to go ahead and pray, but in the next few weeks, we'll be going over those essentials that we mentioned at the beginning, right? But we want, I wanted to start with the word because we need, this is our standard, okay? So let me go ahead and pray, and then if you have any questions, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word again. How your word really does revive the soul. How your word is true, how it's living, it's powerful, how it's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And Lord, forgive us for the times when we think that we can do anything apart from you. Forgive us, Lord, when we are so full of pride and we don't fall at your feet in recognizing how desperate we truly are for you. We thank you for preserving your word for generations to generations and that your word is true, reveals who you are, it reveals who we are, and it reveals your gospel. May you continue to be glorified throughout our lives as we lift you up in Jesus' name.